and David and Jenny. We are really excited to have you here. Uh, I'm a member of Clear Mind Stockholm. If you want to ask anything about our organization, talk to me. Or Christopher over there. No. Uh, <laughs> we will have two breaks, mm -hmm. half an hour each, which I think is great. Uh, and Anna will, who knows David, will no. say a few words about it. We have not a Thank you. I will also to say welcome to you and welcome to David and Jenny. I was the one who found David first in Sverige on the internet. And I saw that he went around to different places and said, but now we have to go to David in Sverige. Och det var hösten, eller ja, vinter 95. Och sen dess har han fortsatt att komma tillbaka. Varje år faktiskt. På 13 månader. Mm. Hela Norden. Och eh, det som är så härligt med dig är att han är så enkel och lättsam. Mm. Som liksom den bästa kompis. Kändes det på en gång. Så det är jättekul att ha honom här igen. Och jätteroligt att se alla er. Många, eller en del i alla fall som jag känner igen sig tidigare, men många nu är också. Okej, varsågod Jenny. Okej. Jag heter Jenny, alltså. Jag har <coughs> rest tillsammans med David sedan januari i år. I, runt i Europa och eh, Australien och Nya Zeeland. Um, nu är vi här och um, jag sköter filmningen. Så om om någon inte vill vara med på film så kan ni säga till nu så ska jag försöka undvika det. Det är okej okay för alla. Mm. <laughs> och sen, vad var det? Jo, om någon har mobiltelefon på så är det bra att stänga av den. Jag är lycklig till det att, att min mor, hon vill gärna in henne på akuten så ah, hon får okay. ingen om Okej, okej. Är det okej okay bara att stänga av ljudet? Ja, ja för jag har inte ja. ljudet på den bara. Det är okej. Okay. Okay, let's begin. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for inviting me to come here. Uh, is there anyone here that requires uh, translation? Did you already work that out? Does everyone understand? No. I have not worked it out, and I think that I hope that no one really requires it. Is there anyone who needs translation from English? Do you need it? Okay. What, the, what we yeah, thought we. Yeah, we thought just somebody could could fill her in. If you have anything that you need to know, just or we could have anybody else do the translating. But we thought we there might be one or two people that would. I don't know. No, som är frivillig som känner att man kan fylla i på svenska. Bara sitta bredvid eller. Finns det behov? Kan vi fråga först? Det finns. Yeah, maybe I can do it. If I need to to have a little bit. But in that case, it's better that I do it. I think so. You can manage it. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Ska vi ta plats för att jag jag flyttar ju eller jag lyssnar ju flyttande så att säga för att jag förstår det mesta men jag är inte tillräckligt säker för att kunna översätta. Well, the title of this talk today is The Fear of Redemption. And so, you know, you could translate that to the fear of love, because love and redemption are the same. Redemption, we might say, is, is like a synonym for salvation. Uh, and, and that term has a lot of different religious uh, connotations. So we could use another synonym of correction. Uh, we could say that in Christian terms, sin just means error or missing the mark. So redemption or salvation means the correction of the error. And that's what this journey through 
life on earth is about. It's about learning to accept the correction to the error of separation. So, in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says that, that only the mind needs to be saved or salvaged, and it's only salvaged through peace. So that really makes it simple if you keep those two points in mind, that we're not trying to save souls, or save people, or do missionary work where we're trying to save other people like uh, traditional Christianity. This is about salvaging your mind, coming to self-realization or enlightenment by accepting the correction that the Spirit offers for the error which has been called ego. So, redemption is really the correction for the error called ego. And the ego is, you know, people have, have said many things about the ego. Uh, <clears throat> one time, uh, someone told me that I think in maybe in 12-step programs they call ego edging God out. Uh, when you just try to move God out of the center of your mind, at the core <laughs> of your mind, and you try to put something else in the place of love or God, then that's what the ego is. It's a belief that you can separate from God and from each other. So, when I travel around the world, to, I've been in like 22 countries, and I like to say that what we have on earth is we have six billion people uh, that seem to all be afraid of dying. That's what survival is about, all the struggles of life. But underneath these six billion people afraid of dying is one mind afraid of living. <laughs> one mind afraid of, of admitting that it's been mistaken and accepting the correction to that mistake. So it was interesting, uh, I was uh, staying at a hostel in, is it New Shopping? Yes, New uh, Shopping. New Shopping, and uh, Jenny went out and she said, you know what the, t the title of the talk you know, is, and I said, well, I, what was it again? And she said, the fear of redemption. So she said, uh, you might want to take a look. It was on page, what, 420? 242. <coughs> 242. In the English version. In the English version. So I, I did go out and I glanced over it, and I was just reading through the words, and basically what I was reading was that Jesus was saying, you can tolerate your hostility, you can tolerate hatred, but the thing that you are terrified of is redemption or love. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of an interesting situation where we have six billion people, six billion different personalities, and the personality by definition is, is the ego. So the persona or the mask is the ego trying to hide from this redemption or this love. And there's a tremendous fear of what's underneath the hatred. That the ego made the hatred, but the mind that believes in the ego is most terrified of what's underneath the hatred. That's why, you know, people can say, well, I have good days and bad days. Or, uh, yes, I've got, I've got some hatred and some love and a, a mix of emotions, but what this mix is about is holding on to this mask that covers over this deep love. And so, the purpose of spirituality, the purpose of spiritual awakening is to open up to accept the correction and to experience this love and to drop the mask. To drop the mask entirely means also to drop the personality self, but also drop the environment that surrounds the personality self, which is all time and space. So it's not just a matter of saying, oh, all I've got to do is drop one little mask, but it's also the context of the mask in, in other words, the environment the mask exists in is all of time and space, society. Uh, that's why it seems like such a big undertaking when you go deep into spirituality, is because you have to literally empty your mind of everything that you believe about time, about the <coughs> cosmos, 
uh, I remember one time a friend of mine was, was looking at the course and she came in and she just had this staggered look on her face like she just had been in a boxing match and she just had got hit in the, in the chin. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I, I just read this line in the course and it's just, it's staggering. And the line was, not one thought the world believes is true. Uh, she just said, that's a staggering idea. When you consider all of the concepts and all of the ideas in this world, and that not one of those thoughts is true, that's a very, very staggering idea. But that also gives you a little bit of a, a grasp on what it's going to take to open up to this love, because every scrap of this world was made as a defense against the truth. So anything that you believe about the world is going to be something that you have to question, you have to bring into question. Years ago I had a student back in the early 1990s and she, she was working on the Course in Miracles workbook lesson and she said, <clears throat> she started working with the early workbook lessons and she said, like this first lesson, David, for example, she said, it's, it's insulting, it's, it's, it's offensive, it's insulting, nothing I see means anything. She said, surely he's just kind of, he's kind of warming up here, right? He's just, this is not where this is going, this is not where anything is leading, it's just a preliminary lesson, right? You know, she was, she was on a swing, just swinging, she says, you know, it's, it's actually kind of, she says, what does, who does he think that I am to start out with such a, a humiliating uh, lesson? I said, well, no, actually, that lesson, if you, can, if you can just fully get that one lesson, then you've got the whole book. You don't need to go into the other 364 lessons. And what that lesson is pointing to is that all of the images of the cosmos were made up as part of the defense. And so, whenever you think you can find meaning in any of the images, or in any of the words, or the symbols, then you're, you're still looking for meaning outside of yourself because the images are a projection of this idea of separation. So, if you go further into the workbook, you find Jesus saying things like, you could receive vision, and when he's talking about vision, he's not, not talking about like 20-20 vision with the eyes, he's talking about the vision of Christ. He says, you could receive vision from a table if you would withdraw all of your ideas from the table. And instead of telling the table what it is, you open your mind up, <laughs> withdrew all your previous past associations, and then you ask the table, what am I? Uh, Jesus is saying, it could tell you, because it shares the purpose of the universe. It's just that this image of a table is just a concept. And all of the past associations of what a table is, size, texture, shape, color, you know, all of the things and associations with tables. What are tables for? You know, associations with bodies and, and maybe eating or writing or something. All of those memories and associations are part of this ego defense mechanism. So when you work with something like the Course, it gets to be very much like, like with Zen Buddhism where they say, empty your mind of everything that you think. I empty the contents of consciousness and then what you're left with is a forgiven world or a healed world. <coughs> so, starting back with the course in 1986, you know, that was what I undertook was to go into an experience where I would have to be shown how to trust and how to forgive and how to uh, watch my mind very carefully, but more like to be the observer, just to be able to watch the world as if it's a, a theater or a play. Uh, Jenny was actually saying that, that the world is feeling more and more like a theater. What were you saying when you first got back to Sweden? Yeah, I had an experience now when I came back because I've been with David and traveling and, and uh, done a lot of undoing in my mind. And when I came back it felt like people were playing a theater when they spoke to me in Swedish. <laughs> it felt really funny. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
<laughs> you were watching the theater. Yeah. Was it where we were? New shopping? <laughs> yeah, new shopping and on the even on the plane when I heard the Swedish people. And, yeah. It's working. <laughs> yeah. How am I going to manage the course if I don't have a job and I can't manage a job? I mean, it's it's pretty uh, it's very hard doing the course sometimes, and and you have to practice the course perhaps uh, on the, in your work and things. You, know, you have to be able to work uh, as a human being first, aren't you? Uh, before you can practice the course. That yeah, it's, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the sense that, that you have to meet your basic needs first yeah, yeah. and then as you begin, the course is a path of, of practicing with wherever you are in your awareness. Whatever your life situation is, you start working with the text and with the workbook. Yeah, whatever your life situation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we can say where the course is leading is leading to a, a place of trust mm. and of opening more and more to your intuition, but, but you would start practicing. So in terms of like your situation with not having a job, um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about your, your circumstances. Yeah, I, I have, uh, I don't know how you say this. Uh, uh, I am sjukskriven, hur säger man det? On sick leave. On, on sick leave. Mm. And, and it's good we have that here in Sweden in a way. <laughs> so you can have money and things. But uh, I am on sick leave and I have been that for about 10 years. And uh, I, I think I, I have a kind of... A, I'm difficult, I have difficulty in doing things, you know. And working, you know, getting the shower and I'm kind of depressed. And I have been there for... I have, I have been that for many years, uh, depressed, I think I would say, that I am. Uh, I think, and uh, uh, because, uh, yeah, and very uh, sort of immature in many areas to a very difficulty, very unsure in, in, a, in a working place, in a situation where you have to mm -hmm. manage your work, you know, and I'm very insecure there, in front of, in front of people and uh, uh, I uh, uh, yes, very sort of perhaps even sure, but very uh, uh, very tense and things. So I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got, I haven't got a job. Uh, yeah, I, I have got jobs, but uh, but not uh, a job with the real um, wages, uh, sort of real money from. Uh, uh, yeah, so so that, that so uh, I have got uh, this uh, different job, but kind of, kind of a different age to it. Uh, my uh, my one of my jobs was uh, in a store in a in a where you would buy food, the leaves and stuff. Oh, and I worked there for two years, and um, but it was very difficult. It was oh, very difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Well, I think the first thing to keep in mind is the context. <clears throat> so, for example, whether we're talking about relationships or working in a job, um, the context of everything that you will do as you work with the Course in Miracles is undoing the ego. Mm. So. I know for myself that when the Course first came to me back in 1986, I had to start with it right where I was in my awareness, which was I had been in university for 10 years, I had student loans to pay back, you know, I had basic debts and basic survival 
needs that, that most people have and so on and so forth. So as I began doing the course workbook lessons and reading the text and so on and so forth, I realized that that whatever job that I would be given would first and foremost be for my mind training opportunities. In other words, it's not just a the course isn't something that you theoretically just go off and read by yourself and and try to ignore your worldly situation. No, no. <laughs> can kind of think it out in your own head. It's not right. possible. <laughs> right. You actually it's almost like the the world is your laboratory. Yeah, yeah. So that just like in the science class, you read the textbook and then you go into the lab to actually see to try the experiments. Well, those workbook lessons are the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. For that. So, and I've worked with many people that are talking about the same situation you're bringing up. I had one friend um, who hadn't worked for some time, and it was, <clears throat> she'd gone round and round about this thing of working and, and found it difficult working, and she finally made a prayer to the Holy Spirit, and she just said, please, Whatever would be most helpful in terms of a job, please bring it to me, bring it into my awareness. And she said, and I will take the first job, I will be open, but I will take the first job that is offered to me. And she had some, a number of interviews kind of sprinkled around. And the first job that was offered to her was working in a school. And her first reaction was, oh no, I don't like to work in a school. And it had more to do with, with her ego preferences and also her fears and insecurities, because she did not graduate from high school. And so she had all these insecurities that were projected onto schools. <clears throat> so it took a moment for her to go, oh, that's right. I asked the Holy Spirit to send me a job, and I said to the Holy Spirit I would accept the first job that was offered. And the first job that was offered her was to work in a school, so her initial reaction was, oh no, you know, please, not that. But actually, it was very helpful for her because she had these insecurities and fears. So the first thing to keep in mind, in, in one sense we could say, <coughs> whatever job that you are guided to, whatever job the Holy Spirit has for you, will be used in a way that will be undoing the ego. And that's the first and foremost uh, lesson to keep in mind. Yes, jobs do bring in money, it helps you pay off bills, and helps you with basic survival things, but First and foremost, you have to remember that what, what comes to you is just for the undoing <coughs> of the ego. Undoing of the ego. And, uh, and uh, if you, uh, perhaps if you read the course on the, uh, the workbook, is, is, uh, uh, to do the workbook then, it's, it's, uh, it can help you so you can uh, get, <coughs> get more, uh, oh, oh, you can uh, take this and perhaps more jobs. And choose from more jobs that you can think of. Yeah, I mean, it will help you. It will help stabilize your mind. It will help help get at the stuff that's underneath. <coughs> In my case, I was. I had a very intense job that went on for eight months that it was a very, very steep undoing of the ego. And I would, would say it was certainly not a job that David would have picked. Um, when it came to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know if I would last two weeks at the job. Because I had ten years of university and I thought I knew something, uh, and with this job, 
I was a case manager working with uh, <clears throat> people with disabilities, physical disabilities, mental disabilities, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder. So for me, when I got into this job, I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to make it here. And what, what I, the guidance I was getting was, you need to learn how to pray. You've been in Christianity for all these years, and you, you still don't know how to pray. Uh, you still don't know how to ask for help. And a lot of the worldly learning that I got in psychology and 10 years of university was a lot of techniques and theories and so on and so forth. Yet when I got in with the clients, before I would go in with the clients, the Holy Spirit would say to me, you need to pray, and when you see this client, you need to practice seeing them for the first time. Don't read all their case histories. Don't have any preconceptions and judgments about who they are. Don't think you know how to treat them, what's right, all the typical things that you would need as a case manager, the Holy Spirit was saying, no. I want you to let all that go, and I want you to pray. And then I had the most remarkable experiences with these clients. And it lasted eight months, and sure it helped me pay off <coughs> student loans. It was very practical in all of those terms. But I'd say more than that, it was really, it was almost like we all had like a chip a chip on the shoulder. We had pride of thinking we know how things work, how to run the show. And when I went in there, this was more like, oh, you're not going to be a miracle worker until we get the chip of pride knocked off your shoulder. So, I think at times during those eight months, the ego perceived that job as, as actually humiliating. <clears throat> you know, I thought I knew something and I felt like Every day things would come at me so fast that I couldn't really react and I couldn't control the situations. They came at me so fast that it actually helped me learn how to trust and how, instead of trying to think my way through things, to become more intuitive and to listen and to follow. I had one client that uh, that basically people, other case managers warned me. They said, he is, he's been in and out of the system and, oh, you're in for it, David. This guy is all these multiple diagnoses, he's on multiple drugs, and he's been in and out of the system for years. And they, everybody, nobody wanted to even work with the guy. And I remember he was assigned to me, and I remember asking the Holy Spirit, okay, um, what do you want me to do? And, and all I kept hearing was, just pray and just see him as perfect and innocent when he comes in. Don't read all the stacks and stacks of, of, of past uh, writings that, that all these counselors had accumulated for years. Don't look at any of it. Just practice seeing him as perfectly innocent when he comes in the door, and disregard everything that all the counselors have told you about him. Don't, don't put any faith in any of it. So when he came in, I took him for an intake interview, and I basically just saw him as innocent, and I listened to him. <clears throat> and after five minutes, all this profound stuff started coming out of his mouth, and I just was like staggered. I just listened and listened as he kept talking and talking and talking, and finally I said, where did you learn this stuff that you're talking about? And he said, the Holy Spirit, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All this build-up of how, how, what a terror this guy was, and it was, it was really beautiful, you know. It was one of those moments of, don't think you understand, don't think you know what's going on. Just be willing to show up and to be helpful, and don't try to add on anything else. Don't try to say, oh, but I can add this diagnosis or this interpretation. You know, it's like, that's how we heal, is we show up with willingness, whether it's a job that you may have, or I have, or whatever the job seems to be, 
We have to show up with willingness and then not try to add any more onto that, but just let the Spirit do it through us. So that's how it worked for me in a very practical way. And it was a good start. I mean, I think before I started to travel and have the Holy Spirit speak through me, I was guided to a series of jobs that were all about undoing the ego, but also that helped me pay off basic debts that I had. Because, you know, you can't, I think to do God's work, you know, you, He meets you exactly where you're at, but also He had to clear away a lot of things in my life before I would kind of launch on, on my life's purpose or my life's calling. And all of this was very important too. I couldn't skip over anything. So, yeah, uh, you, no, I don't know. It was, uh, I was thinking, these feelings you have within the side of you, that you shouldn't hide it, you, you must look at the ugly things that you say. And, uh, mm -hmm. this, you, you can't go around just feeling nothing, you know. And, that's that's uh, and and the uh, honor if you're on work you you will confront feelings and uh, that's good because then you get it out get the feelings out yeah they have to they do have to come into awareness in that yeah. section I was reading today on the fear of redemption he's saying you do have to raise into awareness mm -hmm. uh, these obstacles and these feelings. You have to get them out. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You have to let them up and you have to let them out. So, for example, you mentioned uh, depression. Yeah. And in the Course, Jesus says, depression comes from a sense of being deprived of something you want but do not have. So, so basically underneath all depression is a sense of, of lack or scarcity in which the mind is in an unnatural state of mind where it's wanting things. And, of course, a job becomes very important when you want things. Because in order to, to purchase things, you know, that's what the job is for. But underneath it, you might say that everyone who comes to you in the job setting or the job situation uh, is part of the healing plan. So it's part of practicing seeing people innocently over and over and over to the point where you admit to yourself that you are not seeing anyone clearly. You're just seeing reminders of, of the past that are still in consciousness. So we never really meet anyone for the first time. We're always just seeing something from our past that we're holding on to coming up again and being acted out right in front of us. So, in that sense, it gives us a great opportunity to say, ah, thank you my brother, thank you my sister for mirroring, for reflecting what I'm still holding on to in my belief system that I have not raised up into awareness and released, and you're acting it out and giving me an opportunity to see it and to release it. So, in a practical way, that's what a job is about. A, a job, just like a relationship, is, a, is an opportunity to use the opportunities to heal that way. Now, I've, I've been in 22 countries and, and Sweden has, like you said, has a system here for those that are unemployed to, to receive money to live on. Yeah. Now, I do talk a lot, I've written magazine articles on Divine Providence and living in trust and living in Divine Providence because I don't own anything at this point and I don't, I don't possess anything and so there are people that, I used to be the, the director of a, of a non-profit organization so I had some duties and some things to oversee but I kind of, recently I said no, my hand's out of the pie so I've really just stepped away from from all of that. So, my one job, you might say, is just to go be happy and shine my light wherever I'm invited and so forth. But to come to that, 
what I would say is that you have to, everything is good practice for integrity, but also you start to realize that everything in your awareness is part of divine providence. Even when you're working in a job and you're receiving a paycheck, it's really God. It just looks like an employer and a paycheck. But all of us are under the same law of divine providence. So when you receive money from uh, unemployment or from, from being sick or on sick leave or whatever, that's part of the divine providence as well. The divine providence or what does that Well, it's, it takes. <laughs> we have to get this one. Gudomlig Gudomlig Okay. Yeah. So everyone's really living under that law of divine providence, whether you believe it's coming through a job or not. But we we could say that the Course in Miracles, what it does is it it makes you more and more humble. So that you start to see that everything that seems to be in this world, that's part of your life, that's helping you on the plan of awakening, is all coming from, from the Spirit. It's all the Spirit using the symbols. So that's a very important step. In that way, it's not, it doesn't have to feel a sense of a stigma or a darkness around not having a job. It's not so much whether you have a job or not, but it's just that to be willing to have the ego undone and to allow the Holy Spirit to use the symbols in a way that supports you in, the, in a maximal way. Yeah, yeah. So I had a friend who came, uh, Kirsten, came all the way from New Zealand to spend some time with me, and she was on disability at the time for... She told me that she was very, very independent, strong-willed, very young, independent, successful. And the first thing that got her attention was she had a, she was skiing, and she went flying off of the slopes and out of control and smashed her head. She had a head injury. And that really slowed her life down from, you know, bigger, better, faster, more kind of go-getter kind of lifestyle, but she told me she didn't really get it. Uh, she was back out doing more extreme sports and whatever after the, she recovered from her first head injury. So the second time, she was on a mountain bike. She was going over with these, she was riding with these guys and they were ahead of her and she was on a mountain bike. She went over some very uh, high mound and she lost control of the mountain bike and she had her second head injury, and that got her attention. When she broke both of her wrists, and she was like a baby bird, and her, her mother and father had to feed her uh, because she, she couldn't even move her wrist, she lay there and she started to say, hmm, well this must have a purpose. And it was, you might say, it was the beginning of the undoing of the ego. Most of us hopefully don't have to go through such extreme <laughs> Uh, things, although some of us, I'm sure, could tell our stories. We've gone through some pretty extreme things. People go through near-death experiences and and whatever before they they start to say, "Wait a minute, something's up here." But when she came and met me, and she started traveling and working with the course, she was still receiving disability payments. And I said, "Well, that's still part of the divine providence." And she would just we talked we talked a lot about integrity. Because as, as she got, her energy got more and more, she was able to, to stay up more, she was much more alert. And she got to a point where she actually started feeling a little guilty for taking disability money. <laughs> and she started to feel better and better and better very quickly. When she was traveling with me, we were working through a lot of things. So at one point, I said to her, well, how does it feel? And I said, she says, it feels like I should contact my my uh, disability manager in New Zealand and just tell this man everything that's going on and not hide anything and not hold anything back. I said, yeah, I think that's a very good idea. 
Uh, you, this is a pathway of not abdicating responsibilities or trying to, to dodge anything or get, get something for free uh, that, that you have to deceive or that you have to lie about. So she actually uh, wrote to her disability manager and said, I've been in the United States, I've been traveling, I've been working on my healing and, and working on forgiveness and things are progressing and I have much more energy. And the man just said, well, okay, it all sounds really good, you're progressing. We, we still want to give you another three months of disability. And she said, what should I do? And I said, well, if they're going to offer it to you, <laughs> you might as well take it. I mean, the key thing was don't hide anything, don't withhold anything. But that was part of divine providence too. So sometimes the divine providence comes through a job or being paid on a job. Sometimes it can come through a sick leave. Uh, you know, many, many different ways. People have told me stories of, uh, you know, finding money in the street and on and on and on. Anything that seems to support you as you're doing this inner work, you know, you have to, to start to say, ah, this is just the Holy Spirit using the symbols. Yeah. And I don't have to judge the use of those symbols. I have to kind of be where I am uh, and uh, accept uh, and try uh, and use you know, I am very, I am quite active anyway, and I am doing things, yeah. not a real job, but uh, right now anyway. But uh, I am trying to stay active and, uh, and uh, things like that, and uh, yeah. So uh, 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 I'm going to be looking for a job now and try to try that. Yeah, and you can offer, before you even do the looking, you can just, you know, offer up a prayer and say to the Spirit, you know, whatever job you want me to have, please bring it to me, bring it into my awareness, make it obvious. That was always my prayer. I would say that over and over to the Holy Spirit, you know, make it obvious, make it obvious. And it sometimes comes in, in very obvious ways, but the important thing is to have the context, to realize that the job is for the undoing of the ego. And everything that you're doing now, even in this active phase, when you don't have a job, can all be used in a very maximal way too. So, so it starts to wash away the guilt of feeling like you're less than, or the, it washes away the comparison, you know, with other people and where other people are at. Those are all ego devices to kind of keep you down. Yeah, to keep. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, about fears. I, I, I've got very old fears. Like it started when I was young, and I was blushing, and people started to scold me, and it spread to that I was afraid of trembling on my hands or my voice. And then it came to with women that I was afraid to perform, or, or I, I put such pressure on me that I was afraid all the time that I would not be able to perform. And uh, it feels like it's, it's there. Uh, deep down, it's, uh, it's a great fear of uh, being abandoned, of separation. And also, it's a, like a play in my head where it's one part of me bullying the other part scorning myself, doing the same to myself again and again. And one part getting very submissive and uh, afraid, fear, fearful. And this is just uh, going on. And it was right today that I saw this play uh, quite, uh, was quite clear to me what's going on in my head, that I'm trying to get the distance to it. 
Um, but it's still there. It's something I'm afraid of. If I meet a woman, will I perform? Will I be abandoned? And it's a great, great pain. That I, it feels like I could just scream and scream and scream out this pain. Uh, yeah, this is my cornerstone. Yeah. Yeah. Could you comment? I know I've mentioned this to you, yeah. but I, <laughs> I need a lot of angles to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, there's. I, I, I also say I, it's clear that I'm doing this to myself, that I keep hurting myself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a line in the Course that says, until you are willing to look on the full extent of your anger, or your hatred, you will not be willing to let it go. In other words, when you go on the spiritual journey, the closer you come to the core, to the origin of the ego belief system, like you were going down a, a spiral, or down a, a funnel. The closer you get to the core, the more intense it gets. Because on the other side of the core is love. And the ego, entire system of the ego is built as a defense against the love. All the unworthiness, all the guilt, all the shame, the feelings of abandonment that are certainly projected onto the characters, you know, through your life, feeling abandoned by people in your life. Even Helen Shuckman, the scribe of A Course in Miracles, she wrote a book called The Gifts of God, which was her poetry. And she had some pretty dark poems in there, but they were abandonment poems, directed at Jesus. She was Hearing Jesus' voice for seven years, he's talking to her like a friend, like a guy, like a confidant, for seven years, taking down this book, and then she writes these poems, You said you would always be with me, you know, <laughs> the stuff from the Bible. I'm with you always, even to the end of time. How could you abandon me? How could you say such a thing? So the ego is the belief in abandonment. And it either gets projected onto God, or onto Jesus, or onto the Holy Spirit sometimes, and certainly onto certain characters uh, that are part of the dream. And all those projections do is just reinforce the feelings. It's almost like get, drawing forth witnesses and evidence to what you believe. And that's what makes this world such a convincing hallucination. It was made by belief, and then when you believe in it, you draw forth all these witnesses that confirm what you believe. Kind of like Pygmalion, or the self-fulfilling prophecy. Whatever you believe about yourself, the cosmos will witness back over and over and over. So, there's a term called circumscribed. You know, when you circumscribe something, it's like you're you're completely surrounded. So Jesus is saying, you believe in separation and you circumscribe yourself with this, this environment that completely witnesses and reinforces what you believe about yourself. And now in quantum physics they're teaching us the same thing, that no two people see the same world. That everybody's seeing a, a subjective world based on their own preferences. So we have six billion people <coughs> that are literally seeing six billion different worlds. And because we have some elements of, of, of congruity or of sameness about the sky or the ocean or the weather or things, that's what makes it convincing. It makes it look like it's a real thing, a real environment. But it's more like, in Star Trek terms, it's more like a holodeck. It's a holographic projection that looks very, very, very real. And then when you start projecting people out as part of that environment, 
that speak and seem to speak the same language as you, that agree with you about certain things, then that makes it even more convincing of a, not seeming to be a hallucination at all. So, what you're talking about is, this has been your history, and now you need an intercession or the miracle to show you that there's another way. That's why we have A Course in Miracles. It's like a, an intercession to, to break the pattern. And, for example, even feeling like fear of rejection with women, or feeling like you have to perform, performance anxiety, all the things, uh, fear of abandonment, and so on and so forth. As you start to gain more confidence with miracles, in different aspects of your life, it will begin to transfer to other areas. And so, it's typical, and for myself and people that I've worked with, and the people that I've heard, they will have some very significant experiences that actually show them a different way, you know, show them another way of seeing themselves. They, they have one experience Jesus calls it an out-of-pattern experience, because it's, it's not like the typical pattern. It's an out-of-pattern experience. It shows you, wow, there's so much more here than I was aware of. And that starts you on a momentum to take your, your awareness, your consciousness, higher and higher and more expansive. I use the example from my own life of, <clears throat> I was... Uh, in high school I was so shy and quiet that I was voted most quiet in my senior class. So out of 200 and some people, I was in the yearbook. They, they gave us actually a microphone to hold me and this other girl, because we were both voted most quiet. So I have to laugh now that I go all around the world talking about <laughs> forgiveness and God. And it started off with most quiet. You know, that's where the personality was. And then the Holy Spirit just said, okay, let's wash that away. That's, that's just an impediment. That's going to be a hindrance. You can't be shy and quiet if you're going to let the voice for God speak through you. So it just kind of got washed away, washed away. I, I read that too about Moses. Moses had, had a stutter, and he had to deliver the Ten Commandments. And Gandhi was also very shy. I read his autobiography. And he seemed to be kind of a mover-shaker in terms of this world, in terms of non-violence and so forth. But those were inspiring for me to be aware of, too. Because it just showed me that as I gave my mind over to miracles, I had new experiences. And those new experiences were like lighting up my mind. Like saying, oh, it can be different. It really can be. It doesn't have to be the same way that it's always been. And so, I, I think you have a lot to look forward to uh, in, in your life, really. Because as you work with this journey, the Course, for example, is such, such a powerful tool that it, you don't really have to have a lot of money or a lot of skills and abilities for it to be impactful. But if you have willingness and you work with this tool, you can go so far, so fast, just from the willingness. And, and what happens is you get new experiences that cancel out the old experiences. You know, you keep getting these new experiences over and over and over and over, and they actually do a fine job of, of washing away or canceling out the past. In fact, you know, that's a, that's a major teaching is the past is gone, it can touch me not, you know. What, what time but now can truth be known? Now is the only time that there is. And so the more that you work with it, the more you have an experience of just being in the present, and that present experience is full of confidence, is full of joy. You actually have loads of, of joy that, that come, and yet performing or um, comparing or all the typical ego devices just get washed away so that you don't have those same devices operating anymore.
So you've got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to hearing about these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Låtelse i tankarna liksom och försöker leva så gott det nu går med mitt kursen liksom. Och jag tycker det desto mer jag försöker desto djupare in i rädslan och smärtan och svarta tankarna och sjunker jag i liksom. Jag har gjort en jäkla soppa av det hela mitt liv under de här åren liksom. Och tvivlet, allt det här liksom, det bara kommer väller, väller in i mitt. Det är som smärta ibland så att jag känner att jag kanske inte står mm. ut med det annat. Är det nödvändigt för att möta alla denna rädsla av smärta för att bli fri någon gång? Eller finns det, jag menar, ibland sitter jag och hoppar jämfota liksom, jag vill ha en uppenbarelse så att jag <skratt> <skratt> slipper allt tvivel och, och alltihopa va? Så att är det nödvändigt för att kunna bli fri från detta någon Det, det är rädsligt i dem. Nödvändigt att, 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 att ha det mörkret, att, att ha den upplevelsen. Mm. Att, att bli fri från detta någon gång. Jag menar, det känns att det blir bara värre och värre. Se, mm. se. <coughs> He's trying to live as the course is teaching and practice forgiveness, but it feels like it's uh, getting worse because uh, uh, the doubts are just increasing and and uh, more darkness is coming up. And is it necessary? She wonders. It's necessary to to have that experience. Yeah. We could say that suffering and pain are optional, but that the, ex the experience is that you must go through the darkness and to the light. How? So, oh. How? Well, the first thing you do, and the most important thing you do, is you don't try to protect or cover or hide any emotions that are arising into consciousness. So, for example, for me, I feel like the, the first two decades of my life, two and a half, almost three decades, I could see there was a lot of denial and repression that was going on. I could look back at photographs at my face, and I, my eyes were like halfway closed, and I, I could see this almost face of, of, I was in denial uh, of a lot of emotions that were in there, in my awareness, in my consciousness, that I had never let come out, <clears throat> that I had never got in touch with. So, yeah, the first step is to allow yourself to get in touch with those emotions. And then when you do, it, it's staggering for many people. Uh, there are mystics and saints, like St. John of the Cross wrote a book, Dark Night of the Soul. Uh, most everyone who goes on this journey and really starts to go deeper inward comes into these intense waves of, of hurt and deep sense of fear and guilt and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> that's why I think, comparatively speaking, of all the people on the planet, there are a lot of people that that would never consider making their spiritual journey their top priority in their life. Because they it's almost like opening a can of worms. It's opening something that's so dark that they don't feel like they could handle it. Even if they open it a little bit, they quick put the lid back on. That didn't happen. I didn't see that. Uh, I don't even want to, I'll forget that, I will forget <laughs> that I ever looked, because it's so dark.